So one of the fundamental aspects of what makes us human is a desire to heal, to manage our pain, to care for our loved ones. And so what I want to talk about today is the history of humankind's ability to make medicines to achieve those ends. I want to talk about where we've been, where we are, and most importantly, where we're going. And specifically, I want to talk about our increasing ability to program living things to serve as medicines for us. So let's start at the very beginning. Our first medicines were discovered in nature. The healing arts are as old as humanity, and what we found is if you go back in time, as early as 2,500 years ago, ancient Egyptians were using the bark of the willow tree to treat pain. We know that nature is filled with examples, countless examples of tools and tricks that it uses to ward off invasive species. And so our first medicines are discovered in nature, and they remain relevant today. So the bark of the willow tree is the active ingredient uh, in aspirin, and we all know the story of how an absent-minded scientist can leave a petri dish on a lab bench and give us uh, penicillin. But beyond discovering medicines in nature, we also learned that we could use man-made tools to develop our own medicines. And the most important tool to that end was, of course, chemistry. So going back in time. Centuries, we see the early apothecaries developing、uh, novel molecules, molecules that don't necessarily exist in nature, but that have a beneficial and therapeutic effect. And you can actually draw a line from these early apothecaries to the modern pharmaceutical industry as it exists today. And so, those chemistry-based medicines have served us in countless ways to treat and manage disease. But there's a limitation to what we can do with chemistry. So beyond developing our own medicines, we had to find ways to produce medicines that we couldn't make or synthesize with chemistry alone. So let's take insulin for example. As we all know, insulin is a critical, life-saving medicine for diabetics. But the problem is that it's also a very large and complex molecule, and so it's very difficult, if not impossible, to synthesize insulin using chemistry. And so we had to go back to nature for this one. So we would source insulin from places like pigs, which is not ideal because pig insulin doesn't look exactly like human insulin, and so you you could have negative effects from being treated with pig insulin. And if we wanted human insulin, we had to go to cadavers, which of course represents its own challenges. But almost exactly 40 years ago, not too far from where we are right here. Scientists discovered a new tool, recombinant DNA, that would allow us to produce complex molecules like insulin. And the way they did it is they introduced the human insulin gene into a bacteria and coaxed that bacteria to make and produce insulin on our behalf. And it was that discovery that gives rise to the modern biotechnology industry. And so there's no question that by discovering medicines in nature, by developing them using tools like chemistry, by producing、um, complex molecules with biotechnology-based tools, it's given us a, a very valuable arsenal and way to treat and manage disease. But what's also very interesting is that we're on the cusp of something new. All through history, most of our medicines have act, acted on disease cells or The errant proteins that come from、uh, mutated genes and DNA, or an invasive microbe. But with advances in synthetic biology, advances in our ability to use、uh, things like gene and cell engineering, we're increasingly finding ways to make those same cells and genes and microbes not the target of medicines, but the medicines themselves. And so now we're entering into the era of programming medicine. Now, what does that look like? Well, in the case of a cell, it looks like engineering a cell to recognize cancer, activate the immune system to kill cancer. In the case of a gene, it's introducing machinery that can spot a mutation and repair it. And in the case of a microbe, it's re-engineering a microbe to produce a, a molecule, a therapeutic molecule that can be delivered inside of the body. 
okay, so how do we do this? How do we actually turn cells and genes and microbes into medicine? Well, let's go back to the beginning. So the way most medicines are made um, is to first have a theory on how a medicine would work. What is its mechanism of action? What is the specific biochemical processes that a molecule will impact and affect to have a therapeutic benefit? So how does it work? But the second one is have a very clear understanding on what a medicine does when it's inside of your body. And to that aim, drug developers have developed uh, a framework to think about all of the various knobs and dials that you have to optimize for for a drug to be a good medicine. So the first one is absorption. How is it absorbed inside of the body? The second one is, once it's inside the body, how does it get distributed throughout? How does it get to the site of disease? The third one is metabolism. How is it broken down by the body? And this is critical to understand how a drug is dosed. And then, of course, how is it excreted? How, does it eliminate, how is it eliminated or removed from the body? How do you ensure you don't have a toxic buildup? And then, of course, having a very clear understanding of how medicine could be toxic to healthy cells. So these are two very important and fundamental frameworks for understanding how a medicine is designed and developed. So how does that apply to living things? What are the programming imperatives that you would need to ensure that cells and genes and microbes can serve as good medicines? So there are four fundamental things that these living things need to be able to do well to act as therapeutics. The first one is they need to be able to sense their environment. They need to be able to look and, and, and search for the presence of disease. The second thing is they need to be able to run a predetermined program. They need to be, execute a specific course of action that they undertake when they encounter disease. Next, these are living things, so they can move around, they can replicate. So there needs to be a mechanism to contain them to the site of disease and to ensure that these living things don't go out of bounds. And finally, they have to have an ability to sense when the disease state has been alleviated and terminate their function, and ideally, given that these are living things, terminate themselves if necessary. So programming cells and genes and microbes to sense, execute programs, to uh, contain their actions and to terminate themselves all sounds really futuristic, but it's really happening already. So I want to walk through a couple of examples of that. So let's take cancer. In the case of cancer, it's unfortunate that 40% of the uh, men and women in this room will likely be diagnosed with a form of cancer somewhere in their lives, sometime in their lives. And so a long-standing goal of cancer therapy has been to trigger the immune system to fight it off. This is what the immune system does already. And so what scientists have developed is a therapy known as CAR-T therapy, and the first one was approved last year, that essentially takes out a, a cancer patient's immune cells, engineers the, those cells to react to the patient's own tumor, reintroduces those cells into the patient's body, and now those cells circulate throughout, these uh, CAR-T cells circulate throughout the body, find cancer, attack it, and recruit the immune cells to kill it, kill it off. This is an extraordinary advance in how we treat cancer. And we've seen incredible results in terms of uh, remission rates and even cures. But for the most part today, this is limited to leukemias. And the reason for that is because we need to be able to design more sophisticated methods so that we can sense and execute programs for these T cells. What does that look like? Well, one of our portfolio companies and others are working on this very problem. So in the case of sensing, you can engineer cells to have very sophisticated sensors, like receptors and other uh, tools, that will allow them to search for signals of disease throughout the body. You could also have them search for specific cell types if you know the origin of the cancer. Once the cell receives those signals, um, Asimov, our portfolio company, is developing gene circuits that actually can function as logic circuits that will allow them to compute the inputs and determine the best course of, of action. And in that case, it could be recruiting the immune system to kill, it could be releasing anti-cancer drugs, it could be any number of things and ultimately terminating itself once the disease state has been alleviated. So the future of cell therapy will depend on our ability to program with increasing sophistication 
cells to go after a broad range of cancers. Now, moving on to gene therapy. So gene therapy has been the holy grail for treating the approximately 5,000 known diseases that are caused by a single gene mutation. But gene therapy has been in a winter for about 20 years. And the reason why it's been in a winter is because uh, 20 years ago at the University of Pennsylvania, a young man by the name of Jesse Gelsinger was the first person to die in a clinical trial for gene therapy. And what killed him was essentially a containment problem. The gene therapy was introduced, it went everywhere in the body, and it resulted in a catastrophic immune response, and that led to his death. And so appropriately, scientists gave pause to think about, well, how can we address this question of containment before we advance new gene therapies? And last year saw the approval of the first gene therapy um, for a treatment of a rare form of blindness. Now, what's especially interesting about this is that it's not a coincidence that blindness is the first uh, therapy that they went after with, uh, for gene therapy. And that's because the eye is actually a pretty well-contained organ. You can inject the DNA directly into the eye, and the risk of leakiness is actually quite low. But there are countless diseases, genetic diseases, that aren't limited to the eye. So what does the future of gene therapy look like? Well, gene therapy actually consists of two components. The first one is the vehicle for delivering the therapy, and the second one is the machinery for actually doing the repair or the replacement of the mutations, so the cargo, so to speak. And so both of those are engineering, engineerable components. So in the case of the vehicle, scientists are working on redesigning and re-engineering viruses that are going to have very low immune response, so you don't have that catastrophic event, and can be very specifically targeted to a, a specific cell type. And to that end, they will contain the risk of gene therapy going where it's not supposed to go, in the body. Now, the second component, and I'm sure you've seen this in the news, is producing the machinery to, with very, very high precision, um, edit genes and mutations as necessary. So CRISPR is, of course, the best-known example of advancements in this space. So as we advance our ability to deliver gene therapy, as we advance our ability to actually very precisely edit the genes, and only the genes that we need to edit, gene therapy will become applicable to a far broader range of diseases, not just limited to those that are easily contained biologically. So let's move over to microbes. So as folks know, the microbiome is increasingly understood to be involved in a very broad range of, of diseases. And it's also known to be very central and critical for maintaining and regulating our health. And in fact, the micro, microbiome has been associated with diseases ranging from inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases, all the way to neurological disorders. And so it's not surprising that scientists are looking for ways to use the microbiome as a therapeutic strategy, or as they call it, bugs as drugs. And the first clinical trial to do this is already on, on, ongoing. A company called Synlogic has engineered a microbe that allows it to break down a, an amino acid in a disease called pheno, phenoketonuria, PKU, in patients that are unfortunately not able to break down that amino acid themselves. The result of not being able to do that means toxic amounts of the amino acid build up, and that can have devastating effects. So this bug, the Synlogix bug, goes into the body and basically does that work for these patients. Now, the problem with the microbiome therapies is that it's largely a termination question. It's how do you ensure that this, micro, this microbe that you've introduced to the body doesn't run amok, doesn't go out of control? And the way they've addressed that is they have found a methodology to use a bug that has a very short half-life. And so it essentially eliminates itself after a few days. But we can do better. So the future is to engineer microbes that are much more sophisticated in their ability to terminate their own function. So imagine for a second you have a disease like Crohn's, you take a pill, the, uh, the, the engineered bugs go into your system, they sense the inflammatory condition, they re release an anti-inflammatory, and they alleviate the condition. You could program these cells so that they do that in such a way that they stay inactive when there's no inflammatory um, markers in the, in the system, in this case, in the gut. Or, if you want it to be you know, doubly sure, 
you could en engineer in a kill switch, where once the flare or the episode has been contained, you take the red pill and you eliminate the bug. So the future of microbiome therapy is also incredibly promising. And so what I want to end on is just to give you a sense of where we are going. This is an extraordinary moment in time for medicine. With these advances, every time that we build and engineer the building blocks for living things to sense their environment and execute programs, contain themselves, and learn how to terminate their function, like programming, every successive generation of these medicines will get increasingly more sophisticated, increasingly more effective, and more uh, broadly applicable to a broader and broader range of diseases. And what's particularly exciting about this moment in time is that when we program these living medicines, they essentially become a part of us. And so in their own way, we're reprogramming them to, so that they can in turn reprogram us. And as we can see in leukemia, as we can see in inherited forms of blindness, as we can see in PKU, these living medicines are finally leading us to where we've always wanted to be, which is to find cures. Thank you.